Welcome to Money Making Conversations. It's the show that shares the secrets of success experienced firsthand by marketing and branding expert Rashawn McDonald. I will know. He's given me advice on many occasions, and in case you didn't notice, I'm not broke. You know he'll be interviewing celebrity CEOs, entrepreneurs, and industry decision makers. It's what he likes to do. It's what he likes to share. Now it's time to hear from my man, Rashawn McDonald. Money Making Conversations. Here we go. Welcome to Money Making Conversations. I am your host, Rashawn McDonald. I recognize that we all have different definitions of success. For some, it's a sizable paycheck. Mine is helping people wake up and inspiring them to accomplish their goals and live their very best life. These are my passions, and that's what I'm going to do for you. I want you to stop tripping over small challenges and prepare to rise above the bigger obstacles that life will present to you. My next guest, Marlon Evans, received his B.A. in political science and M.A. in sociology from Stanford University, where he competed on the football and track football, treating track and football. In 2018, Marlon was named CEO of Next Cube, an investor that creates and accelerates front frontier tech companies with an emphasis on digital health and financial tech. He is on the show today to discuss being a minority entrepreneur, something I am and something we discuss on a regular basis on Money Making Conversation. The story behind the Next Cube HBCU Founders Program and the importance of black wealth creation and generational wealth through entrepreneurship. Please welcome to Money Making Conversation, my man, fellow sociology major, I'm a minor, <laughs> Marlon Evans. How you doing, sir? Doing well, thanks. Appreciate you having me on. Well, you know, first of all, let's let's go back to a couple of things. When I when I was reading through your bio, I loved poli sci. I did my degree is in mathematics, but poli sci was uh, something I fell in love with. I, I actually memorized the uh, the Constitution, and uh, because it was just such a fascinating read for me, and then so that's poli sci of me that that I lend myself to you. That's what you got your degree in, and then your master's in sociology. That's my minor. If I had to do it all over again, I would not have gotten a degree in mathematics. I would have gotten a degree in sociology because it really opened my life, my mind on how information is being disseminated in this country and how black people are denied their their story in America. Correct? No, absolutely. Just from a, a structural perspective, and we don't have to go through the the entire entire history of it. I think it's all well well documented. But you know, when I was first starting within political science, I thought I was heading down the law the law school path uh, as a way to help reform some of those inequities. And quickly quickly realized that I think being being a lawyer wasn't what <laughs> was in the cards. Uh, you know, for me, I mean, I enjoyed those those classes, but really felt like I could have a greater impact by working directly with, with people. And that's kind of how I got my, got my start along this path. Now, when you say path, what, what, what path are we talking about? Cause like I said, there's so many different mm-hmm. layers to you. I don't want to like think that we're just over here talking because everybody has a journey. You know, when I yeah. got, I left IBM and I became a stand-up comic and then I, then I became a nightclub owner with a very popular comedy club. Then I became a, a sitcom writer and then I became the manager of Steve Harvey. So there's always a journey to this conversation. Now I'm the host of Money Making Conversation, one of several platforms that are important in my life. So, Let's talk about your journey. You know, athlete, uh, being an athlete played a major role in your life. And so was you a scholarship athlete? Talk about that. And then being able to to balance academics and athletics at a school like Stanford. Yeah. No, I was. I was blessed to receive a scholarship to play play football at Stanford. And one of the things about being in that environment, it's like just the rising tide lifts all boats. So I just felt like I was just trying to – you know, hit the level of expectation that my peers were um, were kind of setting for themselves. I'm like, wow, you know, they're the bars that they're setting. Tiger Woods is walking through the the training room. You have someone like Jenny Thompson, an Olympic swimmer, who's who's just around, and you see the dedication that they put to their their craft, and it just inspires you to you to do more. So the lessons learned on the athletic field of what you need to do to be not just successful, but to be at the highest, highest level. I carry those with me into my, you know, daily life as a, as a professional waking up a little bit earlier than everybody else, putting in a little bit of extra, extra time, making sure that everything you do is at that utmost kind of X level of excellence that you expect for yourself. All of that I learned as, 
as an athlete. Because that af- being an athlete gave you the discipline to to really understand mm-hmm. and also the ability to be a, be a become a leader, work with people. That's been important because you know, it's because it's interesting. I look at your resume, you know, football and then track and field because track can be. Can you say track is much more an individual sport? Where football it is, is a, I mean, team, a team sport. So yeah, you, you had two different mindsets you was working it working with. You know, you had you on a track, you kind of like push yourself. On a football team, you have teammates who can push you. Correct. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know, and I have to be a little bit careful because my wife is, is a track coach, so I can't, <laughs> I, can't, I can't say too much on that because she will say it's a team, it's a team sport. Um, but yeah, there is it's obviously more individual in terms of. You know, it's just you at that at that start. It's you, line where, it's you running around that oval. Come on now, it's you. Yeah. It's you. When they when they say go, you go on by yourself, brother. Unless you're doing a relay, you go. It's nobody. Come on, brother. I got you back. If you miss that right. tackle, I got you. <laughs> Nobody's telling you. They tell you you if you slow down, you slow down. You speed up, you speed up. You get tired, you get a cramp, a hamstring is all on you, brother. Uh, so well, and, so and, I can debate her, but she's your wife, so yeah. I, I won't debate her, okay? Because I'm just trying to get through this interview with you, Mr. Evans, okay? Exactly. <laughs> well, I, th- I think what you what you raised is so so important, especially especially now where like um, it's this idea of of hard work, kind of pushing yourself beyond what you you think you can do, just from a, a physical standpoint, is. I think society has kind of said, well, what's the easiest path or how can we create something that gives you five shortcuts to get to where you need to be? Whereas the learning that you get from going through those struggles really defines who you are and builds that, that character. So I, I have two daughters of, of my own and I'm, I'm always encouraging them to kind of, when it gets hard, that's the good part. That's when you want to lean in because it teaches you so much about about yourself and that kind of self discovery that happens in athletics is the same thing that happens in entrepreneurship where you're starting something from scratch you have naysayers just like you do with in athletics so you really think you can make it to the NFL come on what are the chances same thing happens with start do you really think you could be the next facebook or or uber come on that's all you know it's once in a lifetime type thing and so you have to hear a lot of no's, a lot of people saying you can't do it, and you still need to be able to kind of push through that. And I think we as a society getting back to, to sociology and, and now more with the advent of, of technology are trying to make it so you don't have to work hard, which I think is ultimately not what's in the best interest of us as people and, and as a community at, at large. You know, it's really, we're going to get to the story behind the Next Cube HBCU Founders Program, but I wanted to bring up something about working hard and being able to push yourself. Because, you know, we always want to push ourselves and want to stride out, stride to the next level of success. And sometimes I look at my life and I always tell people in, in my opening uh, introduction, I'm talking about everybody has a different version of what's success. Some people is a sizable paycheck. Mm-hmm. I, I, I don't know if I'm a, if, if satisfaction uh, is in the language of a person who's successful. Because if you have a billionaire, they want to make two billion. You know, you have a millionaire, they want to be a, become a billionaire. You want a person who has one nice car, they might want two cars. They might want three houses. And that satisfaction is what drives you to be successful. Like every morning, you talk about work, I'm, I wake up early. I get up at 4 o'clock, Monday through Friday, I'm up at 4 a.m., 4 a.m. I'm up. Mm. And that's part of my mantra to be successful. I don't, I can't hit snooze. I can't wake up at 4 o'clock on Monday and Two o'clock. I work on Tuesday. I work up at seven o'clock. That's no. That's uh, my whole world of trying to be successful is, is is incorrect. You know, I was talking to John Hope Bryan, and we were talking about from nine to five you work, five to nine is on you, nine to nine that's that's mailbox money, and that's the goals of what you're mm-hmm. talking about. You're trying to take advantage of that twenty four hours, and that's what the mm-hmm. HBCU founders program that you put together. Let's talk about that. It's about wealth, black wealth creation, which we all mm-hmm. talk about but rarely experience because. You're interesting in the sense, Marlon, because as a as a black athlete, if if black people, especially athletes, had the same entrepreneurial spirit and athleticism, because black people really believe when they go on the back, because I play basketball, I don't care what age, I really believe I can make the NBA. I really believe I could probably play in the NBA, even though I may not have had the talent. 
Same thing with football. I, you felt you could be an NFL player. Mm-hmm. Okay. If we had that same mentality when it came to academics and feel that we could be the next doctor, the next scientist, the next Bill Gates, the next Warren Buffett. That's where your program is really centered on trying to change that mantra from athleticism to entrepreneurism, correct? Yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's a mindset, right? This, this uh, idea that you not only do you have the capacity and the, and the talent, but you um, have to then also be able to kind of think creatively and say, all right, if this is, um, if this is something that I am passionate about, you know, solving, is there another way to go about doing that? And that's the innovation component of entrepreneurship is what I think is, is most exciting. And we all have that in our, in our heart, in our kind of souls, like, most people, if you walk up to them and they say, oh, yeah, I had this amazing business idea. I didn't really do anything with it because, you know, I don't even, I didn't even know where to, where to start. Um, and that kind of, uh, fact that a lot of these great ideas are dying on the vine is what inspired us to launch the founders program where we can go into the, at, at, at an early stage at, while they're, they're still students, right. they have an opportunity to take risks that they may not be able to take two or three years out when they're trying to pay bills and, and those types of things um, and inspire them at that point to say, here's, here's a process that you can go through if you do have an idea Here's a platform that can support you getting your idea and turning it into, uh, you know, into reality. And just by simply making that, you know, connection now, we, there's no guarantee, but at least the uh, opportunity won't just fade away because the person felt like they didn't have access to the, to the resources. And that's what the resource is all about. I, I was reading this by diversity, my commitment to diversity and launch of HBCU founders program on uh, January, January, July 29th, 2020, Marlon Evans. There, is, there has to be a better way. You can always do more yeah. when faced with what feels like an insurmountable challenge. I refer back to the message my dad shared with me as a child, which he continues to reiterate to this day. Growing up in Maryland as an African-American in the post-Civil War, Civil Rights era, I was afforded opportunities to just a decade before were off limits for Americans. Now, off limits for Americans with the pandemic, with what's going on with social change, what is not off limits anymore? Where can we go when you set forth a plan that you have in place that started in the pandemic era? Yeah, well, and I think, you know, obviously it's been a horrible situation, but where there's crisis, there's also opportunity. And the fact that things are so virtual now, I mean, we can connect uh, people in a way that we weren't able to do, or we were always able to do previously, but now people are hyper, um, you know, alert to the fact that, okay, I can have an impact on not just 10 students, but hundreds of students, 300 students plus, which is what we have currently signed up in the program, all through a virtual platform where is if we, if we needed to go to each of the, of the hundred HBCUs, like step by step that we wouldn't be where we are right now and be able to launch a full national program in the course of a four months. So that I think number one, just the fact that the, that the technology, the infrastructure is there. And then I think number two, because we have these two things going on, we have the global pandemic, and then we have the uh, Black Lives Matter movement. People are now uh, sensitized to that fact of, oh gosh, I didn't even realize all of this that was going on and the inequities. How can I get involved? And now hey, with Molly, programs Molly, like this. I know you just like me when they said that. I, I remember I got so many phone calls from my white friends go, I didn't know. I yeah. Did, yeah. I, how, how did you operate? Well, yeah, we just had to operate, <laughs> brother. Sister, I, 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 I'm not, I'm not going to tell you that I'm some hero. It's just a, the hand that black people are dealt with. You know, yeah. we have to, you know, I, I do get nervous when the police officer pulls me over, black or white. I get nervous. 
Because mm-hmm. quite frankly, I don't know why they're pulling me over. And quite frankly, I don't know the story that I have to make up to go home safely. And so, so when I hear when you when you start talking about, it, I have to interrupt you because you know people when they when they say, I just found out. No, we we found out a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And you know that's a part of the the education. But at least now they they want to have that conversation and. And many corporates we've we've partnered with with some they've been, you know, this has been a priority for them in the past, and now they're doubling doubling down. So being able to tie up with AT and T and and Morgan Stanley and their other corporates that are we're in conversation with, they realize that they need to be doing doing more as well and see our our founders program as a way to reach students in the. Um, in a form that they weren't otherwise. And the reality is, and like you said, both of us aren't, aren't HBCU grads. There are a few that get most of the attention. You have the Howards, the Morehouse, the Spellmans of the world that have, you know, traditionally that's where the corporates are going to, you know, to recruit. I was talking to a corporate the other day and they said that the Spellman has something like 750 corporate sponsors. Um, which is fantastic, but you know what does you know the 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 rural HBCU in Mississippi or Oklahoma or Nashville like are they getting that same type of attention? So we were committed as a part of this program to not only service those schools, but we're now up to sixty you know HBCUs. I wish it was all a hundred, a hundred plus to make sure that every student within the um, one of the HBCUs feels like they have access to to our program. Yeah, and that's 104 HBCU schools, by the way. And I, I, I applaud mm-hmm. that because, like, a lot of programs, like I, I point out this, they they know it. The, the, the United Negro College Fund doesn't fund, uh, fund all 104 HBCU schools. That's not how it works. You know, it's like it funds what they consider the top or the recommended schools that they have in their program, and it goes from there. Mm-hmm. So you have to look at schools. I I'm, I was born and raised in Houston, Texas. So I had Texas Southern in Houston, and mm-hmm. I had Prairie View and M down the road. Then I had Grambling next over the next day in Louisiana. Then I had Southern mm-hmm. University. So mm-hmm. the HBCU experience was always around me. But I went to the University of Houston. That was a school. Even though I went down to Prairie View, I went. All my friends were there. I went to Texas. I went to Southern University. All my friends were there. I said, "Well, I want to go somewhere where I, I wanted a different experience." But that didn't mean I lost my black identity. I lost my black culture because when I see HBCUs, I feel it's not only a need for me to bring value. And also the, when I realized that 80 percent of the dentists come from HBCUs who are black, you know, 80 percent of the teachers from HBCUs are black, mm-hmm. you know, 40 percent of the congressmen who are black in Congress are are from HBCU schools. All these numbers are not numbers I'm making up. Twenty three, twenty three percent of the black STEM graduates are from HBCU schools. All these numbers are numbers that I have memorized and I uh, and I speak it out because people need to people who don't know are shocked. Huh? Yep. Yeah. So what yeah. I'm saying when I say that, Marlon, is that it's important that people don't act like they're doing a favor. Like, you know, no. you know, HBCUs, you should be like pumping billions of dollars into HBCUs when you see the results that's coming out of them. Uh, well, you hit it right on the head because we're I'm, I'm an investor. Like mm-hmm. I have shareholders that I have to, to report back to and they're looking for a return on on investment we're going into these these schools yes there's a component of it where it's it's educational and we want to make sure that the students will be you know who who haven't had access to understand what it means to to be an entrepreneur but make no mistake about it this isn't just a a theoretical exercise we anticipate that by getting connected into these these schools and helping develop some of these ideas, some ideas coming out of it are going to be ones that we want to invest in. And we're going to be first in line because we were there at the, at the beginning. And, and that's what all investors want. They want that proprietary deal flow that they get to see first before, you know, everybody else, you know, jumps on the bandwagon. And, and we feel a hundred percent convinced that as one, two, three, and the numbers start, you know, picking up of really successful startups coming out of HBCUs, then 
everybody is going to be flooding the, you know, flooding the doors to get, you know, access and, and be on the front lines of it, which is again, going to be this like rising tide that lifts, that lifts everything. And, and so we're playing our, hopefully a part in that to ignite that spark. Right. And then once it's, once it's lit, then we anticipate other folks coming around and saying, huh, I didn't realize that there was just that level of, of talent there. Maybe I should take a second look. And that's what I was getting at, you know, not realizing and then being surprised. But then and I, I just really want to you know when I when I read about, you know, uh, Netflix making their donation and, the, mm-hmm. and uh, to the HBCU schools and. You know, I, I, I mean, I'm just trying to say it right is that. These donations are long overdue. Let me say that one. Secondly, if you just sit back and realize when I, when I, I get so annoyed whenever I hear uh, President Trump, you know, like he's done a favor, like I've done more for black people. Stop. 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 <laughs> Stop. OK, look, we are not asking for favors. And that's why I think black people have start mm-hmm. have to start trump, trumpeting their success. And that's what I was talking mm-hmm. about early when I was talking about athleticism in the black community. We trumpet that. You know, we, we, we see that as a real opportunity to get out of the hood. And a lot of times we don't see that academics is really the real opportunity to get out of the hood and stay out of the hood. It's through academics. And that's what you're doing with this pro, with this founders program is moving academics to the forefront and then letting everybody know the value of HBCUs. Am I hitting on the uh, am I speaking in the right direction? You are. You are. I mean, just in that the whole what you just mentioned around uh, athletes and entertainers kind of being put on a, a pedestal, which is great. And just drilling down into that a little bit, just to, to make the point of, well, why are, why were they successful? Because there was a level start at the beginning of our conversation of hard work, of yes. hustle, of ingenuity, of, you know, the chips may have been against them, but they figured out a way. I mean, all of that is entrepreneurship. I, there were some students I was talking to over the weekend. It was a Saturday and a Sunday, and they were involved in this program with the Black Venture Capital Consortium. And I said, first of all, let me just give you guys a shout out for the grind. It's a Saturday. It's a Sunday. And you, you all are sitting in here listening to me share about this, about this program, trying to better yourself. I mean, that mentality is what makes for successful entrepreneurs. And we just want to flip that light and say, look, you can do this as well. You've proven it, whether it's on the athletic field or entertainment or the fact that you're sitting there on a Saturday or Sunday, you've proven you have that desire and that will. Now, let's just make sure it gets tied into the the resources that can help that, that grow. And that's what we're we're hoping to do through the HBCU Founders Program, and that's a program. I, I, when I went to high school, Marlon, I was a, I was just a gifted kid, you know, academically. I just walk in the room, see something, walk out the room. It was just in my head, and so didn't want to pick up a book, didn't care about college. I remember my my daughter, my father was a, a truck driver, and so uh, when he gave me my first job opportunity. Uh, my mentors were forklift drivers and black men who unloaded trucks. So that's what I wanted to be. When I graduated from mm-hmm. high school, despite being in the top percentage of my class, I went and got a job as a forklift driver because that was my vision. That was my, I, I man, they, they had cars. They can go in the grocery store, buy what they want buy, and they were having a good time. I thought I, that's, that's, that was good enough for me. And it's about raising the standards. And so what happened was at the, at the simultaneously, I was living that life, but I had some teachers that said, this guy is really gifted. And so they moved me into a small group of students, about 10 of us. One of my best friends, Regina Rodney, she graduated from Rice and Michelle Roberts. She graduated from Purdue University. I didn't even know why they went to those schools. That's how far away I was from academics. And when I Mm -hmm. when I say individuals like me are those are those can be those casualties. If we don't do what you're doing with this program, if we don't put in, 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 I think, uh, like I said, put blinders on opportunities that are unreal and focus kids like me on real opportunities. And then we become mm-hmm. the stars of the community and we go give back because academics are the key for long-term success. As you know, as an athlete, God has given you a, a window where your athletic skill will shine. After a while, they will deteriorate year after year after year. Academically, 
I tell everybody, you can't repo my degree. My degree, yeah. mathematics degree on that wall, nobody's going to repo that. But they can repo your car. They can repo your house. They can repo <laughs> anything if you don't have a position to be able to pay for it. And that's why I wanted to bring you on the show to talk about this because you're stopping the repo opportunities in people's lives, especially in the black community, mm-hmm. if they get their academic story together. Mm-hmm. No, I appreciate that. No, I appreciate that. Yeah, and we, we, we recognize that... Um, we're not, we have to play our, our part, but it's eventually it's going to take a larger kind of effort. And which is why we're pulling in these, these corporates and saying, Hey, look, it's not just um, about writing a check. We need you to engage. We need you to mentor. We need you to be that example for these students to say, Hey, maybe it's, I don't end up going on and launching a business, but I can go work for uh, AT&T or, or Morgan Stanley. And, and then maybe I do that for a little while. And then I remember all the things that I learned as a, as an entrepreneur. And then I start my own, you know, business, but more and more of us need to, to show up and say, look, this is where, here's an example. Here's a, a, a pathway for you to, to get there. And if this is something that you're interested in, we're going to be here to be supportive of that. My my question before we leave the name Next Q, which is really N E X mm-hmm. with three. Uh, how where did that come from? Because the name of the company yeah, is I mean, Next Cubed, even though it says N E X three. Yes, it's uh, it's Next Cubed, and and part of it is that there's kind of you know things often come in come in three. So there's uh, three aspects to <laughs> our you know to our business. We we do our investing. We have some uh, work we do with our corporate partners, and then we work with later stage uh, companies. So those are kind of the three main activities. Um, but probably more, you know, symbolically is just thinking about how we can provide kind of exponential um, growth for the companies that are that are working with us. That you bring what you're bringing to the table. We bring what we are bringing to the table. And then that's going to generate even, you know, exponential uh, returns. So that, that's a part of the, the rationale behind the name. And um, in the future, because, you know, I know you said at and on board, uh, you're mm-hmm. working on Morgan Stanley to come on board, these financial ki- commitments to be able to build a model that has long term success and not some success is not riding the tide of change, which came about mm-hmm. due to the George mm-hmm. Floyd killing and people feeling there's a certain degree of sympathy. This is what I want to make sure, Marlon. I don't want your sympathy. I want your yeah. I, I want your support. I want your support because this is value. This is like, you know, you you know, you 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 mine uh, diamonds because it has value. You 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 mm-hmm. drill for oil because it has value. I'm just letting you you support these HBCUs in the academic opportunity because it adds value. Uh, it brings in uh, corporate citizens, taxpayers, good people who mm-hmm. create uh, high land value, and also make this country safe and academically less challenged and more competitive in the global scale. That's why I want to make sure people understand. I don't need your sympathy. I just need you to start mining and supporting the value that HBCUs and African-Americans in general bring to this country. Yep. No, a hundred percent. And that's, those are the conversations we're having with the corporates and Morgan Stanley has signed on, AT&T has signed on, others will. And what we're sharing with them, and, and they know this, this, this is just fact, like more diverse companies are more successful uh, companies. So they know within their own institutions that they need to start recruiting a more diverse pool of talent because that's going to impact their shareholder value down the road. So they understand it. They're just needing now to figure out how do we do this on a more systematic way so that we're reaching, you know, all of the, all of the talent and they see our program is one piece of that. There's other things obviously that they'll, they'll be doing to, you know, help, help drive those, those goals. But yeah, this isn't, this is not a, a handout. This is a way for you to create more shareholder value by tapping into great talent that's going to help your your business and so we we see it as a win if the companies the students going through the program start a company or if they go work for one of our partners that's also 
a, a, a win for us as well. Well, I know you could have appreciated being an athlete who was recruited to a uh, you know first tier tier one institution called Stanford University, and you got that BA in the political science and that master's in sociology, and uh, we have a kinship, my friend. I want you, I want you to stay in touch with me. I've, I've launched a platform called HBCU Awards, where we recognize a. Uh, uh, Black excellence at HBCUs and black people in general in, in uh, business, entertainment, and um, entrepreneurship. And so these are these are lanes I want to be able to advance. And I just wanted to bring you on the show, Marlon, just to your platform. But it's a platform you can use anytime you feel like it. Okay? No, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. All right. If you want to hear more Money Making Conversation interviews, please go to moneymakingconversation.com. I'm Rashawn McDonald. I'm your host.